Hi everybody, welcome to the next Chem Complete lecture in the aldehyde and ketone series. So last time we took a look at the general structure of aldehydes and ketones, their reactivity when they were placed in different chemical environments, mainly if there's a negatively charged nucleophile or base present versus if there is some sort of an acidic proton or some sort of a Lewis acid present, and how the carbonyl functionality at the heart of the aldehyde and the ketone really play into that. So if you haven't seen that lecture, I really encourage you to go back to the beginning of the playlist or check that out and then continue forward here. So what we're going to address today is naming aldehydes and ketones. Okay, so even though aldehydes and ketones are in this same type of functionality and they have the same sort of reactivity with their carbonyl group, they do have different ways of being named because they are different functional groups. So this is one of the few lectures in this series where we have a differentiating point, whereas most of the aldehydes and the ketones moving forward when we look at their reactions, they're going to undergo the same sorts of reactions. So let's start with aldehydes and then we'll go to ketones for aldehydes the rule like with most upper level functional groups is that the parent chain must contain the aldehyde group and what that means is that even if you have a parent chain that's 20 carbons long if that aldehyde is found branching off of the fourth carbon or something of that nature then you have a five membered carbon chain and the rest of that material would just be a substituent because you have to include the aldehyde the carbon for that carbonyl that contains the aldehyde has to be included in the parent chain okay now number two is that you need to prioritize the aldehyde so when you start numbering the aldehyde will always be number one and that's because when you look at aldehydes, they are terminal, meaning that that hydrogen that's on the other side of the aldehyde ends the chain, if you will, because you cannot bond anything else to that hydrogen. And because these are terminal functional groups, you're going to see it says no number in step three here. That's because you don't need a number when you're naming the aldehyde. Now, your other substituents will need a number relative to the aldehyde, but you don't actually have to number before you list the aldehyde itself because it is a terminal group and it should always be prioritized as number one. Okay. Now, number three says that you drop the E for AL. Okay. So for instance, if I had propane, it becomes propen al. And I don't want you guys getting this confused. The AL is different than the OL. So propen all, which is an OL, is going to be an alcohol right? It would be the propanol alcohol. If you have AL, it is an aldehyde, and that is the way that we should name our aldehydes. So propanal, AL, would be an ethyl group, and then that carbonyl, that would be the third carbon that contains the aldehyde. That would be propanal, okay? Now, this one's a bit bizarre. Students usually don't like this, but this is the way that IUPAC currently has it set up. If the compound is cyclic and there's an aldehyde coming off of the compound, then it is named as carbaldehyde, and that comes after the name. So let's say that I have uh, a five-membered -mem ring, a cyclopentane. I would name it cyclopentane carbaldehyde if it just had an aldehyde group coming off of it. Again, cyclic compounds with that functional group should be number one. You don't need to number that. Okay, but it's very different in compared in comparison to calling it, uh, you know, cyclopentene al. And one of the reasons this is confusing is that is how we would name it for an alcohol, right? We would say this is cyclopentanol if you had an alcohol group on there. But for some reason, when we have the aldehyde, the IUPAC rules are that we're not going to do that. Maybe because of that extra carbon. Uh, you know, I, I honestly, I don't know why they choose to say carbaldehyde, but that's what it is. All right, so we have some examples down here. Let's take a look at these examples and do our best to name them. So see if you can name them for a second. I would encourage you to pause the lecture, 
see if you can tackle these, and then unpause it, and we'll go through it here in just a second. All right, so hopefully you got a chance to check these out. Okay, now one thing that I do want to point out before we get started here is that the carbons containing the carbonyl count towards the carbon count of the main chain. Okay, so don't get confused because like when we've been dealing with things like an alcohol, an alcohol is an OH group. It doesn't have that extra carbon. It may be attached to a carbon on the main chain, but now the functional group directly has that carbonyl carbon and we have to count that towards it. Okay. So if you take a look and we're prioritizing the numbering here, you would have one and two. And so this two membered aldehyde would be ethanol. I come over here, same general premise. It's going to be one, two, three, four this time. So for four, I would use butte. And so this compound would be butenal. Okay, now check this one out. If I look at this, well, the longest carbon chain would technically be right here. One, two, three, four, five, six. Now, the issue with that is that I didn't capture the aldehyde and its carbon in that naming process, in that first step. So that is not valid. I cannot use that hexane. I have to capture that aldehyde. And so that means that the longest group is really here. It's going to be one, two, three, four, five, right? Because to validly name this with the aldehyde there, I have to capture that aldehyde group. So it's really a pentanal. But before we get into naming that, we do have some substituents that we want to take care of. Namely, we've got a methyl in position 4, and we've got an ethyl in position 2. Now remember that you need to number these, and you need to then alphabetize them when you are getting ready to actually write the formal name. So if I look, ethyl is E, and methyl is M. So I would start this with the ethyl group, and I would write 2-ethyl. Then I would move on to 4-methyl. And then I could finish the name after the 4-methyl, and I could call this pent and al Okay, 2-ethyl, 4-methyl, pentanal. And then if you come down here, we have the cyclic compound. This is a cyclohexane. Name it as such, and then add the word carbaldehyde at the end. So the proper name for this structure would be cyclohexane carbaldehyde. Okay, so that pretty well covers what you're going to run into with aldehyde functionality. On the rare case that you might come up with a double aldehyde, meaning both ends of a given chain are an aldehyde, not impossible, you're going to have a dial. Okay, so you don't want to forget, just like we've talked about dienes for double bonds or diols for double alcohols, you can have a dial. And I don't want you to forget that. In fact, I think in the ketones, I have an example of a dione uh, when we get to this. So speaking of ketones, let's take a look here at the setup for how we're going to name ketones now. All right, so when we do ketones, some of the same general rules apply. Number one, the parent chain must contain the ketone group. So wherever that ketone may lie, it has to be included in the main parent chain. I can't ignore the ketone or have it off to the side and not counted in the chain. Okay, number two, number and prioritize the ketone. That's similar to everything else that we've been doing. Uh, we just saw examples of that with aldehyde. Number three, drop the E and add own to the name. So now instead of al, we're going to be using own for ketone. Okay. If another group is present, then you're going to name as an oxo substituent. Now, this can get complicated. I want to show you an example. Uh, the example that I used uses an ester down here. And so unless you know how to name esters, 
you're not going to know how to name this direct compound. But the point of naming that third compound down here is that there's a ketone in the middle and an ester technically is a higher level functional group as far as naming. And so when you've got these two competing groups, the ester gets prioritized in the name and the ketone takes the back seat as a substituent as far as the naming is concerned. And so I want to show you this oxo type substituent naming. Okay. And the point in that is I want you to really see how the oxo numbering and labeling is used more than I, I want you to be, you know, preoccupied with the fact that we're naming an ester at that point. So just a point of clarification there. Okay. So if I take a look at this, let's take a look at the first one. Okay. Oh, uh, pause the video. See if you can try these, right? And then come back. All right. So hopefully you had a chance to do that. I take a look at the first one. Okay. I've got a ketone. It is right in the middle. So I could number left to right, right to left. It's not going to matter in this case. So I'm going to do one, two, three, four, five. Okay. So five is pent. Now, ketones are not terminal. And therefore, I do need the number because I could be talking about it in position two, in position three, in position four. It's not guaranteed to always be in position one. And because of that, I need to make sure that I have that number there. Okay, so this would be three pentanone. Okay, I come over here and I've got one, two, three, four, five, six. So it's going to be a hexanone, but I've got two of them in position two and four. So it's going to be a dione. So the way that I would technically number and label this is going to be two comma four, and then it would be hexane. So when you have the dione, you're going to write the whole thing for these higher level functional groups, hexane, and then dione at the end here. Okay. So this would be two, four hexane dione. Now, the last one, like I said, I don't want you to worry so much about how did we actually name this, although I will explain, excuse me, I will explain it briefly as we're going along. I want you to pay attention to this group right here, okay? So for an ester, the way that you name an ester, you're going to grab whatever group is attached to the oxygen here, and that's going to be what you label the ester as first, Okay, as you're labeling it. Now, if there's other methyls, ethyls, chloros, you would name those as well. Okay, but the ester gets the priority. And because it gets split apart by this oxygen, we really start numbering at this carbon then. And we consider this sort of a substituent of the main chain. Okay, and the way that we write this is methyl, because that's the group that I see. Okay, this is part of... Uh, labeling esters. So you do methyl. If this was an ethyl, then I would label it as ethyl there. Okay, and then I continue. So I've got one, two, three is the location of the uh, ketone. So it's going to be methyl, and then I'm going to have three oxo. Okay, and then I continue forward. I've got four, I've got five, and I've got six here. Okay, and when you have an ester, you end it in O8. So it's going to be hexen O8. Okay, again, this the point of this video is not to teach you how to name esters, but what I wanted you to see here is the three oxo portion is referring to the ketone in the presence of a higher level substituent. Or it's, I'm sorry, the ketone is a substituent. It's in the uh, presence of a higher level functional group. Okay. Um, there you can go online. I should probably do a video on it at some point. And you can find an ordered list of which functional group kind of gets priority or outranks the others when you deal with naming. Okay. And some of your higher level carbonyls are going to be at the top of that list, like carboxylic acids, esters, things of that nature. All right. So that is it. If you would like to help support the channel, you can head on over to Chem Complete, and we have guides at chemcomplete.com, how to pass organic chemistry. I'm working on an aldehyde and ketone guide right now that should be available hopefully by the time you're seeing this video 
or shortly after that. So go on over to chemcomplete.com. You can support us over there. You can browse. There's lots of free resources. As always, liking the video, subscribing to stay up to date with the content we push out is always great. And if you have questions, leave a comment. I'll get back to you. I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day, and I will see you for the next lecture where we start talking about how to create aldehydes and ketones. See you later, guys.